So this morning, we're going to talk about another data structure. It's another fairly important one. We're going to talk about heaps. I'm not even going to read the blue text today. If you want to read it, go download the slides. All right, so first, before we can talk about heaps, we have to talk about what is a complete binary tree. And we'll see in the next slide why it's important that we're reviewing this. But remember that a complete binary tree is a tree in which every level, except possibly the last, is completely filled. And then the last level, the nodes are as far left as possible. So this is a complete binary tree. Um, there's a cool thing. If you know that your tree is complete, you can calculate the height only knowing how many elements are in the tree. So for example, this tree has one, two, three, has nine elements. So how would we calculate the height of this tree, given that it has nine elements? Here's a hint. It says right there. Yeah, so you take log base 2 of n. n is the number of elements. So log base 2 of 9 is like 3.15 something, probably. And then you take the floor of that, so you round down. Well, you don't round at all. Actually, you truncate the decimal places. So that gives us a height of 3. Log base 2 of 9 is like 3. And if we look, 1, 2, 3, that is the height of our tree. So that's fancy. That's cool. That means if we know the size, we can calculate the height in constant time using this simple algorithm. OK. So in that case, what is a heap, or more specifically, a binary heap? A binary heap is a complete binary tree. So heaps have to be complete. Nodes have to be left most as possible and filling all levels. It is not a binary search tree. So when it says binary tree, it does not say binary search tree. So the properties of binary search trees have nothing to do with the properties of heap heaps. Completely different. So for it to be a heap, the values in the nodes have to satisfy the heap ordering property. And this is the heap ordering property. Uh, it's different. There's a thing called a min heap and a max heap. But in a min heap, each node is greater than or equal to its parent. So this is a min heap here. So if we look at each node, 4 is greater than or equal to 2. 5 is greater than or equal to 2. 7 is greater than or equal to 4. 4 is greater than or equal to 4. 6 is greater than or equal to 5. 9 is greater than or equal to 5. And then 11 and 13, etc. So this satisfies the min heap property. For a max heap, it's the same, except for each node is less than or equal to its parent. So instead of greater than or equal to, each node will be less than or equal to its parent. Uh, yeah, again. Uh, no, actually, the order of the input determines how the tree will look. So we can have this same set of data, but in a different order. And when we generate the heap, the heap will actually look different. Um, so does anyone, maybe that is not certain that they already know the answer, want to take a guess as to why heaps might be a useful data structure? Yes. In fact, it's super useful for finding the minimum value or the maximum value. That is a great answer. So if we look at this heap, we can tell that 2 is the smallest value, and it's at the root position. So in a min heap and, and a max heap, the root position will always either have the minimum or maximum value. So that's an interesting property. And as we'll see later, we can leverage that property to do some cool things with heaps. OK, yes. Is the height of the tree the same as the maximum depth? It's a good question. Um, I think the answer is probably yes. Depth is like the farthest most leaf, and you count up. So yeah, they should be the same. OK, any questions about the definition of a heap? OK, pretty straightforward so far. This is a caveat. Heaps are not considered sorted. So it's not like a binary search tree where we can very easily get the elements out in a sorted order. In binary search trees, we can do an in-order tra depth-first traversal to get all the items in order. We cannot do that with heaps. 
Heaps are not sorted. They're considered partially ordered. Okay. By the way, this is a max heap. So the last slide had a min heap. This is a max heap. We can see that 14 is the largest value and that for every element, it is less than or equal to its parent. Okay. So now let's talk about priority queues. So priority queues are a special kind of data structure where you insert a bunch of items and then the first item you grab out of the left side, the first item you kind of, you know, DQ, will always be the minimum value in the case of a min priority queue. So because of that, priority queues are basically heaps, what we've just been talking about, but there's other ways you can implement priority queues. So they are like distinct names. The priority queue is like a specific behavior, and the heap is one way to implement a priority queue. Anyway, so in priority queues, elements with smaller numbers have higher priority. So we can imagine a system in which we have a bunch of things we need to do, and we assign a numerical priority to each of those things. We can insert them all into a priority queue and then start pulling out the things in the order at which they have the most priority. So something with very small priority, like two or three, might be very important, so we might want to do that first. Something with some big number, might, maybe like 100, might be low priority, so we want to do all the high priority things first. So elements are inserted in big O of log n time instead of big O n time for something like a sorted array or a linked list. So we could make a priority queue in an array or a linked list, but it would be slower than doing it as a heap. And similar to binary search trees, ordering happens with each insertion. So the cost of ordering is distributed with every insertion. We don't have to insert a bunch of elements and then do a separate ordering operation. Instead, we pay a little bit of performance penalty every time we insert to ensure that the data structure is always in its ordered state. So what kind of things can you do with priority queues? Well, routers, use them to prioritize data packets. So routers have a queue where all the incoming packets are added, and then depending on if it's like video traffic, for example, or voice over IP, those sort of real-time streaming applications have high priority. So those packets should get sent to their destination before like a standard HTTP request trying to find the latest tweet on Twitter, where that's kind of like loading asynchronously. So routers use priority queues, heaps, to determine which packets should get sent out and routed first. Uh, tracking unexplored routes and pathfinding. So there are things called searches, like A star search. They're sort of similar to depth first and breadth first search, but they're modifications. And you can use priority queues in those to prioritize which routes you want to explore next. Um, instead of doing it sort of algorithmically, you can use a heuristic to determine which route is most likely to take you to your destination and then prioritize that route. Bayesian spam filtering. So the spam filters that Google uses to keep spam out of your inbox are probably some kind of Bayesian spam filter. Don't ask me how they use priority queues in that. I don't remember, but you can look it up. Uh, data compression. And finally, in the operating system, load balancing and interrupt handling. So in your operating system, you have all these different threads, all these different programs vying for execution time on the CPU. They all want to be to have time to have their stuff executed. So if you have 20 applications open, or even 20 Chrome tabs, for example, how does the operating system decide which ones should get more execution and which ones should get less? And the answer is it uses priority queues and some other fancy algorithms to determine which thing deserves the most CPU and to try to assign priorities to them. And using a priority queue it basically pulls tasks off the queue, executes them for a certain amount of time, then halts execution, pulls the next thing off. So you can imagine we have multi-core CPUs now that have basically multiple processors in one. But 15 years ago, those were not common or maybe they didn't even exist at all. So if you have only one core, how is it possible that you can run 20 applications at the same time on your computer? And the answer is, with priority queues, it will take 
the application with the most priority out, execute it for a short period of time, then halt execution completely on that application, grab the next one, run for a short period of time. And because processors are so fast, to the user, if the processor is fast enough, it looks like it's all real time and they're all happening at the same time. But actually, each application only gets access to the CPU to run in small, discrete t increments of time. So big thing in operating systems. OK. So now let's talk about something cool. A cool property of heaps is that because they're complete, because every node must be filled the level and as left as possible, we can actually take this whole node data structure and instead store it as an array. So we can visualize the heap like this, but we can actually implement it like this, and that has several advantages. Um, so the way you do it is that you just follow level order traversal, so breadth first, and you just stick them in the array in that order. So we can see the root item is at index zero, then the first item, index one, then the right child of the root, index two, et cetera. So if we do that, how do we then jump to the children of each item? So if we do it as a node, we can always say the root node.left to get access to its left child. Well, when we store it in an array, we can actually just calculate the child index and jump there directly. So you can calculate the left child index as 2n plus 1. So in this case, the root uh, element is at index 0. So what is its left child index? Well, 0 times 2 plus 1 is 1. So then we go to index 1, and we can see 4 is there, and that is correct. What about 7? How do we calculate the right child? Well, here's the formula for the right child. So someone tell me the right child index for element 7. Yeah, Dave. 8. Yes. Why is it 8? Yeah, so 7 is at index 3. So times 2 is 6, plus 2 is 8. And there we can see 13, so it all works correctly. So that is kind of cool. And then also you can calculate the parent index for any given child. You just take the index minus 1 divided by 2. So if we wanted to find the parent of this green 4, well, that green 4 is at index 4. 4 minus 1 is 3. Divided by 2 is 1 and a half. What do we do with the 1? We actually truncate it. So then we look at index 1, and we can see the blue 4 is there. So we correctly calculate the parent of the green 4. All right, so what are some advantages of storing the heap in an array instead of using sort of the standard way we did a binary search tree with nodes? Well, it uses less memory, so we don't have to have a node class. We can just insert items directly into the array. Or if we were doing like a key value thing, we could insert the key and the value directly into the array. So we don't need to allocate extra chunk for every item for the node class that stores the next pointers. And then there's a second advantage, which is you can do this thing called heap sort. So you can take any array of unsorted items and run the heap sort algorithm on that array, and then you'll end up with the same array but sorted. So we'll talk about heap sort in a bit. But that's a cool advantage of doing heaps as arrays. So does anyone want to tell me why we don't do this with binary search trees? Why can't we just stick a binary search tree in an array and do it the same way? Right. So why does that uh, prevent us from being able to use an array? Right. So Kevin said, we can't do this with a binary search tree because binary search trees are not complete trees, which means that they could have some element that like branches way, way down and has a super deep depth. And then if we wanted to store that element in an array and be able to use the same indexing, we'd have tons of blank space in an array. So we might theoretically have an array with only one item every 10, 20, 50 spaces. So at that point, it becomes very memory inefficient, which is sort of the point of using this representation in the first place is, is that it's more memory efficient. OK. So let's talk about how do you insert an item into a heap. You have a heap, and you want to add something. Well, the algorithm is fairly simple. You just add the element to the very end of the array. So if you were doing this in Python, 
You could have your array representation be a list, and you could just use append to add it to the end. And once you've added that element to the end, you run the shift up algorithm, also sometimes called percolate up or bubble up, in which you swap that element with its parent continuously until you reach the condition where it satisfies the heap property. So in the case of a min heap, the element has to be greater than its parent. So if we look here, this is a min heap. It's got two at the top. If we want to insert three to this heap, we stick it at the end, and then we run the bubble up algorithm. So is three less than seven? Or sorry, is three greater than seven? And the answer is no. And so that doesn't satisfy the min heap property, so we have to swap it. So we swap it, and now we have this kind of situation. So is three greater than four? The answer is no again. So we swap it, and now we have this heap. Is three greater than two? The answer is yes. That means we're done with the bubble up algorithm, and we have successfully inserted something to the heap while maintaining the heap property. So how can you do those swaps? Well, if you're using the array representation, it looks like this. We add three to the very last spot in the array. We just append it. Then we calculate the parent position using n minus 1 divided by 2. And we check. Um, so the former parent position is 3, which has the value 7. So is 7 uh, less than 3? The answer is no, so we swap it. So now 3 is where 7 was. 7 goes in 3's old spot. Then we do the same thing. So we can see that the next, uh, so 3 is here. Uh, we calculate the parent. 3 minus 1 is 2 divided by 2 is 1. So then we compare this 3 with the element at index 1, which we just calculated. Is 3 greater than 4? No. So then we swap it again. So now we have our heap. Notice, again, that this is not sorted. So it goes 2, 3, 5, 4. So that is not sorted. This is not a binary search tree. Heaps are not sorted. They're just ordered. OK. How about delete? So actually, first of all, can we even delete a random element in the heap? And actually, the answer is no. In general, with heaps, you only insert things or do things with the root node. So it's a priority queue for a reason. We can only grab out the item with the most priority, whether it be the minimum item or the maximum item. So when you call delete, it's actually normally called delete min or delete max, and it only can delete the root node. So what is the algorithm to do that? Well, you take the root node and you replace it with the last element in the tree, or sorry, in the heap. So in this case, 9 is our last element. That means it's the rightmost element in the list, in the array representation. And in the sort of tree representation, it means we go down to the last level, and then we go as far right as possible to find the last element. But that's actually like something you can't do easily. If you're doing this as a tree and not as an array, how do you figure out where the last element is? And there's not really a good answer. You could do a breadth first search and then just stop when you reach the last element, but that takes n time. Instead of just knowing where it is in the array, which is constant time. So array representation, the right way to do heaps. So anyway, you take the last element, you stick it where the root node was that you just deleted, and then you run the shift down algorithm, which is the same as shift up, except for you're swapping things down until they satisfy the heap property. So in this case, we're going to delete 2, which is the min item, and we're going to replace it with 9. So we do that. So now we see, does this satisfy the heap property? Uh, is the child of 9 uh, greater than 9? And the answer is no. So we can see 4 is less than 9, so we have to swap it because this is a min heap. Then we do it again. We say, are the children of 9 uh, greater than 9? And the answer is no. But we actually look at both children. So this is a little bit different than shift up, in which we only compare with the parent. With shift down, we have to look at both children, and we swap with the smallest child in a min heap or the largest child in a max heap. So 
Here, 9 is at the root position because we just replaced it there. So then we see that it's greater than both 4 and 5, which is wrong. It should be less than whatever is in the root position. But we swap it with the smallest child. Then here, 9 is the parent of 7 and 4. Again, we swap it with the smallest child. And finally, we can't swap anymore because there are no children. So we have now reconstructed our heap, and it satisfies the heap property. Oh, OK, so any questions on deletion in heaps? Again, the algorithm is delete the root node, replace it with the last element, and then run the shift down algorithm until you can't run the shift down algorithm anymore. Yeah, Kazi. Yes, exactly. So, so to ensure that the tree is complete, we can't really grab a random element and stick it in the root position. We have to grab the last element and stick it there, which will ensure that the tree is still complete. And then we run this swap down algorithm to make sure it's a heap again. We'll talk about that in a bit, but we can talk about it now. What is the time complexity for deletion? Anyone have any ideas? So you can calculate it exactly, maybe, like the worst case, by knowing the height of the tree. That's true. In general, given a tree with height n, what is the complexity? Yeah, Josh. Yeah, log of n, exactly. So when we delete, it's constant time to remove the root element and swap the last element there. But then shifting down is a log of n runtime operation. How do you keep track of the last element? Well, if you know the length of your list, then you know how to calculate the last element. Um, OK, so there's a couple other methods. We've done insert and delete. The other ones are peak. All peak does is return the value of the root node, nothing other than that. And size returns the number of elements in the heap. So those are both pretty easy, pretty standard for any sort of data structure. All right, so now let's talk about an algorithm called Heapify. Heapify takes any kind of array, usually unsorted, unordered, and then it converts that array into a heap. So if we want to construct a heap out of an array of elements that we already have, we could either do it one of two ways. We could just insert each item one by one into a heap, or we could run this Heapify algorithm on the array itself without having to copy memory into a new array or something like that. So let's talk about the Heapify algorithm. So you start at the last parent node, which you can calculate this way. So the last parent node is the basically the last node, the lowest and rightmost node in the tree visualization or the rightmost node in the array visualization that has children. So anything that's a leaf is not a parent node. But so you're just looking at the last internal node. So you can calculate this like this. Because it's complete, we know that the last parent node is actually just the count of the number of elements, minus 2 divided by 2. And then what we do is we take that index and we work our way backwards on every parent node throughout the heap. And for each of those nodes, we shift it down until it satisfies the heap property, and that's it. So the end result is a heap. So let's look at what that looks like. In this case, this is already ordered. But to calculate the last parent node, well, we see that, again, this has nine items. So 9 minus 2 is 7. Divided by 2 is 3 and a half. Truncate, 3. So then we look at the item in index 3, and it we see it's the 7 right here. And we can see that that's the last parent node. OK. So who would like to run through the Heapify algorithm on the whiteboard? OK. So here's the Heapify algorithm again. We can see this is our heap here. So first, we calculate the last parent node using index is equal to count minus 2 divided by 2. So what is the count, first of all? Um, that would be 9. 9, OK, cool. So then what is the index of the last parent node? That would be 3. OK, yep. 
three, yeah. So it's that two that's right there. It's the last parent node. So then we're going to um, do a... Let's do a max heap. So we're going to shift this down with the greater of the two children so that the larger of the two ones ends up going up. And ultimate goal is that the largest element in the heap should end up at the root position. OK. So, um, so 2 is less than 11. 2 is also less than 6. Uh -huh. And then 11 is more than 6. So OK. So Dan said 2 is less than 11, 2 is less than 6, so he's going to swap 11 and 2 because 11 is the greater of the two children. We're going to make a max heap. Okay, so there's 11, there's 2. Okay, so then the next step is we take our index, which is 3, and we subtract 1, so now index is 2, okay. which is that 9 there, yeah. Right. So we're going to swap 9 and 13 because 13 is greater than 9, and we're constructing a max heap, which means the larger elements should end up bu bubbling up. All right, so now we subtract 1 again. Index is 1. Okay, so we go here. Uh, 4 is less than both 11 and 5. Uh, so okay, so now we're swapping 4 and 11. And now that we've done that, we actually have to check here if this 4 that we just swapped also satisfies the property, because we have to do it recursively until we find it doesn't satisfy the property. So what do we do with 4? Yeah, so this is kind of pseudocode here, but shift down here means shift down recursively. OK, so then we swap 4 and 6. All right, so one final step. Index is now 0, so we're at the root node. So now we have to swap down the root node. OK, so 13 is bigger than both. So 13 and 11 are the children of 7. 13 is the biggest, so we swap 7 and 13. And then we do the same thing. We have to look at 7 that we just swapped, compare it to its children, 9 and 4. And so 9 is the only element bigger than 7, so we have to swap 9. And we're done. So we have successfully heapified our heap. So thank you, Daniel, for your help. Polite round of applause. So now that we visualized it, hopefully it's a little bit more clear. If it isn't, feel free to write down a random jumble of stuff on your paper and run this Heapify algorithm to convince yourself that it works. OK. So now that we've run Heapify, let's talk a little bit about what we can do with that. Well, obviously, we can take any random jumbled array of stuff and turn it into a heap. But we can also do is our first actual sorting algorithm. So this is the first sorting algorithm that we've introduced to you. It's called heap sort. What you do is you take your array of random stuff in no sorted order, you heapify it. So now we have it in heap form. And then all you have to do is keep on grabbing the element out of the root position and deleting it and sticking that into a new array. And as long as you keep on grabbing, say, for example, the min element and sticking it in order in an array, once there's no more elements left, you have a sorted array of stuff. So that's cool. You just grab it out and then delete it. So this is a very, very simple sorting algorithm. And it's actually a pretty good one. So we'll talk more about sorting algorithms in a couple weeks. And in fact, we have a project in which you will implement many of them. But any questions about heap sort? Sorting algorithms in general, input is a random jumbled mess of values. Output is those same values in sorted order. Yeah. Would heap sort be the lock-in? Mm. So what is the runtime 
of heap sort? Well, I can tell you it's not log n because we have to touch every element to be able to determine its position to sort it. So it can't possibly be log n. So it's got to be n or, n or worse. Well, all right, so let's talk about the runtime of Heapify before we talk about the runtime of heap sort. What do we think the runtime of Heapify is? All right, we have one login. Anyone else agree or disagree? N login. N login. Oh, okay. So that sounds like a pretty good answer to me. N log n, which is like a complexity that we haven't encountered before. So why is heap, heapify n log n? Well, if we look, we only start heapifying at the last parent node, but we can imagine a very huge heap with millions of elements. The last parent node and up means there's still a ton of elements, and that's actually like n elements. It's probably, we could calculate it, it's probably like n divided by two elements that we actually end up touching, but again, divided by two is a much smaller factor than n, so we just discard it. So at the very least, we have to touch n elements to heapify. So at that point, we're a big O of n. But for each element, we have to shift down. And the shift down operation is a log n operation because we have to do it as many times as necessary until we have the heap back into the heap property, back to where it satisfies the heap property. So for every element n, we have to do a log n operation, which means overall the complexity is n log n. Does that make sense to people? Do we understand why heapify is n log n? So what about heap sort? What is the runtime of heap sort? Well, first of all, we know heapify here is n log n. So what about the rest of this? What is the runtime of these three kind of pseudocode lines? n, OK. Sounds good. Why n? Right. So we have to pull every element. So as long as delete min or delete max is n, but is delete min and delete max n runtime? No, why? Right, so we replace the last element and then we have to shift it down. So that shift down is log n time. So this delete min or delete max is a log n operation. Grab min or max is constant. And this outer loop is n, so we do the outer loop n times. So we do this n times, and then this log n times, so that's n log n. Heapify is n log n, so ultimately we have two n log n operations. The two is again a factor that doesn't really matter compared to n, so we combine them, and we end up with log n overall. So heapify is n log n, and then this while loop is n log n. So ultimately heap sort is n log n time. Yeah, Kevin. In what situation wouldn't we use heap sort? Heap sort's really good when you have like already existing array of unsorted data. It's just sitting there. You can do it in place. Uh, well, mm, maybe not. I bet you there's a way to do it, but in this case, we actually allocate a second chunk of memory. So first we heapify, then we just start pulling elements out. Um, and sticking them in. Heapify, in general, is a pretty good algorithm. There are other situations. It kind of just depends on the data, to be honest, and what your memory constraints are, because you can get better real-world performance uh, in certain algorithms like this compared to other sorting algorithms, like, for example, merge sort. But this one uses two units of memory for every element. So the answer is it depends. But heap sort overall, it turns out n log n is a good complexity for a sorting algorithm. Does anyone think it might be possible to do a sort in n time? Could that be possible? Well, if we just think about it, it seems maybe unlikely. 
because to be able to sort in end time means we touch every element either once or only like twice or some constant factor in front of n. But for every element, we have to do some comparisons with other elements to determine where it goes. And so because of that comparisons part, maybe it's actually impossible to do better than end log n. So that's something to think about. We'll talk about it more later when we talk about sorting. But let that kind of stew around. Can we do sorts in end time? Maybe. Maybe not. OK. So now let's talk about the runtime of heaps. We already talked about some of these, but what about the space complexity for a heap? Both average case and worst case. So for every element in the heap, how many units of space does the heap occupy? N? Anyone else think N? Who thinks N? OK, who thinks something less than N? OK, that's good, because that would be impossible. Who thinks something greater than N? All right, so we're in agreement. It's N. So that makes sense, because if we do it as an array, every element occupies one space in the array, it's N. All right, how about insertion? Do we remember what the algorithm for insertion was? Stick it at the end and then bubble it up? So what is the runtime for insertion? Log n? Yep. Actually, we already talked about that. Worst case is the same. Because heaps are complete, we can't even actually have the situation that we had in binary search trees where it's actually a linked list. That's not possible in heaps because they have to be complete. And these insertion deletion algorithms ensure the heaps stay complete. How about delete? What is the runtime for delete? Log in as well. Sounds good to me. We remove the root element. We replace it with the last one. And then we run shift down, which is a log in algorithm. All right, so let's talk about heap sort. We just talked about it. So let's have me. Well, first of all, space. This is kind of interesting. Yeah, Dave. Extract is probably like a pretty good term. Yeah, so you could definitely call delete extract, and that would imply that it's both a peak and a delete, that it returns the element and deletes it. So that sounds good to me. You could also call it like pop if you wanted to, or DQ. Um, OK. So what is the space complexity of heap sort? Well, we just talked about the runtime, but this is space. This is different. So for every element that we're sorting with heap sort, how, much, how many units of space does that element occupy? Well, one element occupies one unit of space. When we run heap sort, we first heapify the array in place. Then we start pulling elements out and sticking them in a new array in order. So that's like 2n space, because we have the original array and we have the new one we created. But that factor of 2, not important. We throw it away, so n space. And in the worst case, still n space. Heapify, we just talked about this. Who wants to shout out the runtime of Heapify? And log it. OK, what about the worst case? Still n log n. Because heaps are complete, the worst case is the same as the average case. We can't end up with a linked list heap. How about heap sort? We just talked about this too. Someone not, David? N log n. OK, sounds good. So we heapify, which is n log n, and then we do the thing where we pull everything out. And that is also n log n operation. So here's some resources about heaps. Can't really read them here, but you can download the slides and click the links. That is it for heaps. Any questions? So you'll notice in your Twitter bot project, I think it's in section 9 maybe, that you have to implement a heap and use it to count the most frequent words in your corpus. So earlier, we were able to do that as part of our sampling. We can count the most frequent words. But it's much more efficient to use a heap to do it. So 
You will implement a heap as part of the Twitter bot project if you haven't already. You will probably want to implement a max heap so that you can use it to count the most frequent words, the words with the highest number frequency. And you'll probably want to do it using the array representation because it's the more efficient form of heap. OK. Any questions? Yes, Josh? Is there a tree implementation of it? There is a tree implementation of a heap. Uh, it's the same as a binary search tree. You create nodes, and then you have them point to children. But because certain operations are less efficient in that representation, and because it uses more memory, it's generally not really done in the real world. Yeah, Adrian. OK, so the question was, ideally, by when should we finish the Twitterbot project? The answer is, ideally, by Monday, because Monday we're starting iOS, and we're going to throw a lot more work on you. But we realized we already threw a bunch of work on you with the Twitterbot project and with the Maze project. So for many of you, it might not be possible to finish by Monday. That's OK. You should work you know, as hard as you can. The expectation actually is that you spend some time outside of class working on this stuff in general if you want to get through it all of it. So that means spending some time on weekends or spending some time nights to finish everything. But again, there are no grades. We're here to push you but not to pull you. So it's basically up to you how much time you put into them. And you can sort of weigh how much benefit you think you're getting by doing these things. But ideally, it's done by Monday. If it's not, that's OK. Um, we'll still help you out with it. Um, just keep on plugging away. But yeah, starting Monday, if you haven't finished with the Maze or Twitter bot, you'll have like three active projects in addition to applying to jobs. So no one ever said it was going to be easy. Cool. Any more questions? So yeah. By the way, if you're behind on the milestones on Twitterbot, totally OK. Most of the class is behind on the milestones on Twitterbot. We pretty much had to schedule it as aggressively as we could to fit everything in this semester. Um, but the expectation on our end from the beginning was that many people might not be able to finish it within that timeline so that they could continue working after. OK. Thank you. Uh, Continue working on all your stuff. And this afternoon, we have a lecture on bit manipulation, which is a topic that is really interesting and cool and also happens to show up in the maze generating project.